Club Penguin. One of the greatest virtual worlds or online games of all time. The best thing about Club Penguin to me, besides being a cute social world featuring penguin avatars and minigames and more, is that it was always a bit of a meme in the online gaming community. Now don't take that the wrong way, I actually think that this speaks to how good and successful Club Penguin was as a title, especially given its little known humble upbringing and overall target audience. This all contributes to Club Penguin having one of the biggest audiences and largest impacts on online gaming. How was Club Penguin able to do this as a kid-friendly MMO, something quite unheard of, doing this for well over 10 years launching back in 2005 and continuing on even past the game's life cycle in the way of community servers to wide success? We will uncover that and more on this episode of Death of a Game, a series where we take the largest contributing factors in a game's failure and chronicle them through the use of a timeline and various pieces of evidence. Stay tuned throughout the episode for the clues, until we put them all together for the final deduction at the end of the episode. Every detective loves a final deduction, and for the lovers of Club Penguin, I hope I can do your favorite game justice and talk about what made it so magical too. Let's get to the case. I'd like to welcome the video sponsor, Geology. Geology is a 24-time award-winning skin, hair, body, and care company recognized in Men's Health, Hype Beast, Birdie, Esquire, Ask Men, and Oprah Daily Grooming Awards. Their products are built around just a handful of powerful but proven ingredients that have been trusted by dermatologists for decades. Geology is celebrating its five-year anniversary with their biggest offer yet. Take 100% off of your personalized skincare trial set, plus get up to an additional 30% off of add-ons when added to the trial. That means you're getting over $49 in products for free, 100% off of your personalized sample set, and an additional 30% off of the add-ons. Geology's classic everyday face wash for me is probably my favorite. It's the most simple, but it gets the job done. It makes my skin feel great, not oily, and not dry either. As somebody who's right in between on that spectrum, that's helpful for me. Geology can help you fight acne, reduce oiliness, prevent wrinkles, combat dark or puffy under eyes, have smoother and hydrated skin, and target signs of aging. Geology creates simple but effective skincare and hair care routines customized just for you with ingredients that are proven to work. Not only is Geology the best in the skincare game, they also have released a ton of new amazing hair, body, and other skin products. Whatever you need, Geology has you covered. From their affordable skin revitalizing vitamin C and E, Feralook Acid Serum, to their two-time award-winning co-wash, to their brand new body care line and body wash and deodorant, which I personally really enjoy the scent on the deodorant, by the way. With all of this, it takes care of all of your bathroom needs. For a very limited time, click on the link in the description box or scan the QR code and use code NERD100 to get 100% off of your award-winning skincare trial set. On top of that, you can save big on the add-on products of your choice when you add it to your trial. Hurry now, because this is a limited offer. And thank you to Geology for sponsoring this video. The long-tenured story of the kid-friendly MMO Club Penguin begins back in July of 2000. That's because the story actually begins with one of its creators, Lance Preeb, with Rocket Snail, later known as R Snail after he created a simple Flash 4 web-based game named Snow Blasters at the turn of the century. Lance's attention then drifted to his desk, where he noticed a far side cartoon which gave him the inspiration to utilize penguins. This would lead to the creation of experimental penguins, which would later morph into Penguin Chat. In these games, you could customize your penguin and chat with other users in a multi-room format. You can see even from the early gameplay, it looked quite similar to what would eventually become Club Penguin. Penguin Football Chat was the ultimate prequel form of Club Penguin. It launched back in 2003 and it featured various mini-games, some already existing and being successful Rocket Snail games. This was, in my opinion, absolutely genius, and it still hasn't really been replicated since, which is kind of absurd to me. Why build brand new games if you already have access to other games or even just their ideas? You could even just inject those into your online world and give it so much more to do. And that's really where the magic of Club Penguin was built, as the development would start shortly after the success of Penguin Football Chat. Club Penguin being built on the basis of socialization and fun but simple minigames offered something new in the online virtual world space, and offered something many other games should learn from even today. Social games allow people to relax and find more ways to socialize than strictly doing competitive activities or combative ones, which you'll find is actually hard to socialize during. Building CP from the core up in such a way is something that we haven't seen done in online gaming in some time, and we can see the level of impact that CP was able to have because of such. 
Arsenal wasn't alone now. Lance would team up with co-worker Lane Merrifield and Dave Crisco, and would start formulating what would sort of become the game that they wanted to build. Their boss would allow them to create a spin-off company, New Horizon Interactive, tasked with the goal of bringing to market Club Penguin. What sounds quite crazy in hindsight is that the original goal for Club Penguin was actually 2010. My guess is that New Horizon Interactive wanted to really build out a game at their own speed, even though that never came to be, of course. April of 2005 and the NHI team would utilize their third Penguin chat as a testing grounds for what would become Club Penguin. The beta for Club Penguin would happen September 2005, and user counts were smaller than you could imagine, being in the hundreds, maybe even few thousands. This is actually incredibly impressive, however, as the New Horizon Interactive team behind Club Penguin was self-funding, literally the three founders' own money. They were effectively building the hardest type of game there was without much resources to speak of. It was a classic underdog story. The three trio wanted with Club Penguin, something that had some social components but was safe and not just marketed it as safe. Dave Crisco in particular made it his mission to make sure that the game was kid-friendly and advertiser-free, which if you have seen my episode of Toontown and Free Realms, well you know how problematic that can be. The core was simple, but further success and time would allow them to build upon the foundation of the game in the world, which was featuring the internet darling language Adobe Flash, making it playable in browsers and basically on any sort of PC. Club Penguin would launch initially on October 24th, 2005. Club Penguin's initial successes seemed humble, starting at an amazing 15,000 person player base. But within March of the next year, the game would skyrocket up to 1.4 million users, almost doubling by September of 2006 to 2.6 million users. By the time Club Penguin would reach two years, it would already hit a whopping 3.9 million users. This would rank CP amongst top social media websites, which is just crazy to think about in hindsight, right? The success of Club Penguin was so great that it would attract the attention of various major advertisers, all bidding for spots or even purchasing the game outright. However, the creators would relent eventually, selling to none other than Disney for a record-breaking $350 million. There are reports that Club Penguin was just burning through cash, and cash that the dev team just didn't have as they chose to self-publish. This is why they would reportedly sell to Disney besides, I'm sure, making tons of money, right? It almost seemed like they were a victim of their own success, right? As the game was massively successful and yet they couldn't keep up with the demand. So perhaps being bought by Disney, like all things seem to be these days, was just an inevitability. The power of Club Penguin was that it was more than just a game, it was a social world, and while many MMOs can satisfy this in their own ways, very few have actually innovated and changed the space in a big way, featuring social mechanics in such a way. Social-focused MMOs were always special because they almost never featured any serious combat or long-term progressions, which made their social bits more important and more of a focus. Such a game is more than just a game. It's a world where kids, teenagers, and even adults can go and socialize, given some proper moderation and restrictions. This bridges the gaps in ways that really no real-life equivalent can, as it can unite players truly of all kinds and all types. While Club Penguin was widely successful with new content and old rooms being constantly renovated and added, three years after their acquisition, Club Penguin had been stagnating in its growth. While this was inevitable, as the game was already five years old, Disney, a corporation, was more than likely to hit a panic button there than the original creators or owners were. Who were still around, by the way, working with the newly constructed Disney studio to run the game and more. Club Penguin stagnation, however, would allow Disney to forego paying another $300 million as per their deal. While RuneScape was able to survive and still thrives, I might add, as a browser-based MMORPG for over 20 years, it had the gift of many systems such as skill gain, grinding, and long-term progression systems to go along with it. Sure, RuneScape had plenty of social and minigame-style elements, too, but RuneScape plays distinctively different from Club Penguin. Club Penguin being a social title with limited minigames, especially being more dated over time, as minigames can be constantly renovated, innovated, and redone, meant that people had strong feelings and memories with the title, but would eventually quit and move on. While this is typical of any game, even an MMO, it's supposed to be what MMOs are ultimately good at offering you an alternative to. 
allowing you to find a chance to get stuck into a world for days, weeks, and maybe even years. What was also happening behind the Disney acquisition was slow changes that would morph the company behind CP, and CP itself more into a Disney product. The first and most obvious way that this would affect CP was the monetization. After the acquisition, the game was heavily restricted by comparison for free-to-play players. This would contribute to their stagnation as a title, as we have seen this with other kid-focused MMOs. These companies don't realize that kids don't have credit cards yet, so you can't monetize them in the same sort of ways. Now, to be fair to CP, they weren't the only one learning by this mistake, but fans of CP felt bitter because they felt like it was brought upon by the Disney changes, however. More influences from Disney would come through in the way of other platform ports, and even I didn't know these existed. Titles like Club Penguin Game Day, which was a Wii title, and they would also launch another DS title as well. These games functioned as basically Club Penguin Lite-like titles, which was just kind of strange because the minigames weren't really current anymore, and the social aspects would be missing without the actual world. The games felt like a blatant misunderstanding of what the magic of CP was. The original big penguin behind the project that started it all, and then CP itself, Lance Preeb would leave the company October 2010. I know when companies and projects are sold, usually corps negotiate that you stay around for a certain amount of time to help with the transition and to not cause a panic. According to Lance, he wanted more time to spend with his family and had grown fatigued of Club Penguin having worked on it for nearly a decade at that point. Dave Crisco would also leave the same year, either showing that founders think alike, or they were operating on similar timelines. Lane Merrifield would be the last founder to leave, and his departure was said to be for similar reasons as the former two, but with a catch at least. There were some rumors that there was a disagreement with another suit, but ultimately, rumors or not, Lane would go on to have a very successful and worthwhile education-focused career. Being the last founder to leave would now mean that since CP was never really a giant team to begin with, nearly none of the original CP team were being left, and certainly none of the original founders were left. Many people feel that 2013 was a strong shift in the culture of CP and what the game stood for. More and more crossovers would come, this time seemingly milking every last bit of popularity from the CP name and the IP. Marvel, Star Wars, you name it, since it's Disney after all. However, did these crossovers really have a place in Club Penguin? Maybe. In a sense, the game was about fun and social sharing after all. But maybe it was just about how the crossovers were handled, where it felt like it was less about implementing it into the world of CP and more just sort of thrown in there, like featuring Marvel, etc. Club Penguin would continue on for another solid couple of years at a much slower development cycle, reaching 12 years of a live cycle. This was already impressive for an MMO period, even though CP hadn't been an MMO in some time, by the way. As although they started at being capable of 300 players on a single server, eventually they would shift to more of a shard-based approach, greatly shrinking how many players could play on a single server or area. 12 years of life was impressive, especially for a game that looked like it was indeed created in the early 2000s. And especially impressive not being a game that featured large game-changing expansions. The core of CP was good enough to keep over 200 million players interested in it, even if just for a time. And those numbers are absolutely bonkers, and while the game might have shrunk internally, it was massive in player scale overall. Due to slowing numbers, Disney would lay off up to 28 Club Penguin employees in April of 2015. For a small to medium-sized team, this was a tremendous downsizing. Disney Interactive Studio would shut down altogether in 2015. Slowing down now seems to be a natural thing for any online virtual world, but Disney running Club Penguin now meant that anything was game, with corporations sometimes shuttering companies, IPs, or selling or offloading them, or even just many more things. Behind the scenes, likely recognizing the issues that I have outlined, Disney, specifically, Disney Canada Incorporated, would create an all-new Club Penguin title dubbed Club Penguin Island. The biggest shocker would be that the game would be initially only for mobile devices, feature an all-new 3D graphic system, and result in the shutdown of Club Penguin. <laughs> yes, just like that. March 30th, 2017, Club Penguin would be announced to be shut down later in the year. And I kid you not, the same day that it was announced and went into motion, Club Penguin Island was set to be the new successor to CP and would launch on mobile devices. With Club Penguin's death, there was no time for the casket. Disney's idea was perhaps to force an early audience and hope they could impress them enough to stick around. 
though it just seemed unnecessarily risky. As many famous MMO companies like Nexon and NCSoft have continued to make millions of dollars off of 20-year-old virtual worlds. The worst part of the whole exchange was that the supposed replacement was not being positively received. Not only were players mad about the lack of PC, considering that's where the game was originally created, CPI had immense performance issues, probably made worse by the fact that it was on mobile devices only initially. The monetization was also revamped, and according to many players, was far worse. This isn't the first time we've seen an MMO have a sequel come out and only to launch it to middling reviews and have people wanting and wishing for the original to come back. And while people are quick to shout nostalgia as the culprit, that can certainly play a part, but I think it has more to do with the fact that the old games were built slowly with an end game in mind. The new sequel titles are made to catch up on some trends, graphics and gameplay, and more, and oftentimes lose the original magic of what made the first game special such as MapleStory 2, Lineage 2, Ragnarok 2, Dark Eden 2, the list goes on and on, and I've covered many of these games on my series. CPI would eventually launch on PC and Mac, but it felt like the majority of the damage was kind of done. Many videos were calling CPI members only, and it was being used as a new mantra for the new Club Penguin, and not in a positive way, as it was being used to describe the game's exclusionary content. Expecting players to pay a $5 monthly wasn't unheard of, but not taking the old-school RuneScape approach and still making a free-to-play experience an actual game to experience was a fatal mistake. CPI in just a year would shut down, which showed that Disney had high expectations for the launch and very likely signaled the end for Club Penguin as an IP, at least for them, the rightful owners. Club Penguin, according to Disney, was fading away, and they didn't really have an idea of how to solve the problem. So like Corpse do with many IPs, they tried a few times and then they shelf the IP for another one. By 2018, it looked like that would be the fate of Club Penguin. But online worlds don't belong on offline shelves. The devs behind CPI and what was left of CP in general would be let go and offer jobs at another company in November of 2018. It was sad to see the legacy of Club Penguin be so tragically cut short, at least in a sense, and those involved just scattered all around. But like many virtual worlds in this series, with the beauty of human mankind and our desires to preserve worlds and be social, Club Penguin wouldn't be going anywhere. Not yet. Enter the largest and historically most successful private server, Club Penguin Rewritten. Club Penguin Rewritten got off the ground quickly after the shuttering of Club Penguin, which gave them a huge advantage at attracting a proper audience. CPR was the de facto private server people were choosing, but the story of Club Penguin and its private servers are equally as exciting as the story of City of Heroes and its private servers. While community-run servers are nearly always run better than official servers, sorry the truth hurts, there are some issues that can arise when, comparatively, non-professionals handle servers and development. In the case of CPR, there were some serious concerns about the legality of the project for some time as it was taking money in the way of ad revenue and potential donations. When a serious data breach happened in July of 2019, it called into question the security of a private server tremendously, and specifically theirs. But their success was undeniable. Articles were being written about their success and their ability to be a place for people to go during the pandemic. Were CP rewritten and many other private servers would see immense success, as humans always have a desire to be social as social creatures, especially in times of need. CP Online, another popular private server, would be DMCA'd in 2020, resulting in the first casualty in the CP private server preservation war. The reasons being related to a total lack of moderation resulting in anti-Semitism, racism, and even pedophilia, resulting in one associated with the game even being arrested. As much as I champion private servers being better run than live servers, there are some things that private servers just have not historically done very well. And moderation is one of those things. And before the free speech warriors get all angry, this is a kid-focused MMO. With moderation tools built into it, it was always supposed to be necessary. That would leave rewritten as the largest Club Penguin server left, having player counts greater than some live games. In a tragic bit of internet news, Adobe Flash would be announced to be ending. This would mean for all Club Penguin iterations, they would have to transition to being downloadable, at least the popular ones. And while the death of Flash came late, it would have at some point, no matter what, harmed Club Penguin unless they had transitioned off of Flash at some point. Club Penguin Rewritten would enter the crosshairs yet again in 2022, resulting in them being DMCA'd. The situation was different than CPO's. 
as in Rewritten's case, it was regarding the aforementioned monetization of property that they didn't own primarily. So much so that three people would be tracked down and arrested in London. Damn, London fans are the biggest pinguinos. Multiple mods, players, and more have admitted that they were monetizing aspects of the game and website to offset the costs needed, at least according to them. Unfortunately, while I can see their perspective, and I strongly believe in virtual world preservation, the second they were doing that, and the second they're trying to argue it at all, opened themselves up to litigation that ultimately killed them. I get wanting to get paid for work, but remember, private server, community server or not, there are issues of how much of that work is actually yours. How much of that money being paid to you, or should be paid to you, even goes back to the original creators. While there are rumors, and the rumors in the case of Rewritten state that the, perhaps the ads and monetization were a little more than just about server costs, as reportedly many of the staff were able to buy a house or houses with the profits, but ultimately CPR's dying felt less like Disney targeting them because of bad things happening, and more of them being the size and stature that they were, making matters worse according to creator Lance Merrifield, which is always a fear of online private servers. Really, private server preservation is difficult, and not properly understood or supported by the government in the US, the most important government for such. With legislation still lagging behind proper preservation needed for online titles, players taking matters into their own hands is not only commendable, it's resulted in some of the greatest successful private servers or even just period servers ever. But we also have to be honest that sometimes it has the inverse effect, and sometimes games have bad examples. And yeah, we have plenty of games that are good examples of this. It's a tricky water to navigate, but I will always urge on the side, ultimately, of preservation overall. The good news is after the death of these two major private servers, which had higher player counts than modern online worlds I might add, multiple other private servers sprouted up, such as New Club Penguin, Club Penguin Legacy, and more. There's even a Club Penguin Island private server. It's always a good sign that a franchise is beloved when you see the community's support for it so strongly and readily. Bad games don't really get preservation after all. And Club Penguin, despite being a meme most of my life and the butt of many jokes, in the end outlasted many of the same titles that were mocking it. If it wasn't for the mistakes by Disney, Club Penguin in a official capacity would still be around, which is insane to think about. That one of the biggest misunderstandings I find about the story of CP is that people thinking that the game just failed or people got tired of socializing as a penguin. And that just wasn't true. The widely successful private servers show that. The music is playing, fellow detectives, or penguins in this case. That means like a story arc being completed in Club Penguin, whether you chose to be a ninja or a pirate, it's time to reap the rewards of our journey. We have gathered enough clues, so let's put this case to rest. The creators just became fatigued. A 3D mobile sequel failed. Lack of further innovation and in content. Monetization changes. Expensive upkeep. Flash died. The age of the game. Who thought socializing as a penguin in different customizable outfits would be so much fun? People would spend hundreds of hours over the course of 18 plus years doing such. The magic in Club Penguin was simplicity, and simple is better when designing an online world, already containing great complexity. That's because what MMOs and online worlds forget, and often the players of them, is that the most unique aspect of those particular games in the genre itself is the online part. It's the social elements of the games. Sure, the gameplay might have been lacking in some ways with Club Penguin, right? That's not a controversial statement, but it was able to completely dwarf games with far better graphics and gameplay. Because those aren't the only things that are needed in an online world, especially a successful one. And while in the end it ended up being in the hands of Disney, the story of Club Penguin really was an underdog story. An underdog story featuring penguins that changed the very course of online gaming and taught us that online worlds, virtual worlds, and MMOs can be a lot more than just about fighting. Thanks for watching.